We are delighted to announce that we have an official podcast sponsor. We have partnered with Niall O'Connor and the team at Financial Planning Matters Limited. The services given by the FPM team are very personal to myself, Gary, and also Morgan, the co-founders of Training One to One. I've personally used the team at FPM to help me with my long-term financial future, how to correctly uh, make an emergency fund, how to correctly invest in different funds, and how to prepare myself to purchase a house within Ireland's current economic status. If you're interested in the services at this moment with Financial Planning Matters, feel free to reach out to the team at www fpms.ie or you can contact myself Gary or Morgan directly through the Instagram DM through the training one to one page or also by leaving a comment here asking for more information thank you very much the following is a conversation with Roland Finn Roland has captained Chamrock Rovers to four consecutive Premier Division titles he is now signed for UCD for the 2024 season Ronan is much more than a football player, though, and in the conversation today, we dive into topics that include his family life, how to prepare for the future, and also his past football career as well. We hope you enjoy. All right, we are here today with Ronan Finn. Ronan, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me on, lads. <laughs> Off the back of a historic four league titles, how do you feel with the, the year gone? Yeah, I suppose that's football, it moves on fast, uh, I've been busy, um, well I had Christmas obviously, the chance to unwind and relax, um, with family, went on a holiday, so, and it, like that's it, you move on, I'm with UCD now, we're back in pre-season, I've uh, been doing a bit of training on my own just to make sure I'm ready for that, but um, at this stage to be honest, I haven't like, I enjoyed it, you know, the month that it was in, in November leading into December, but uh, it's back to business as usual for me now, as boring as that sounds. No, big time. And uh, I think it's going to be interesting with a conversation. It's going to be a reflection of what has been an amazing career so far, but there's still a future as well with UCD. Um, when it comes to the UCD program and the platform that you're in, is it a case where it's a balance of football and education? And what does the next couple of years look like? Yeah, it's definitely a balance. It's definitely um, trying to hit both areas uh, and be successful in both areas and um, I suppose the way I always took me football and, and done strategic moves moving from club to club there was you know it was um there was always a reason um, and this is no different this is just giving me you know an opportunity to still play football and um, because I wasn't ready to to retire I still feel um I'm fit I'm still you know in that regard I can still move I'm not done um I'm coming back to a you know really good environment. They know UCD. I spent five years there hmm. uh, from seventeen, so I loved every minute of it. So um, and I it was previously at you know Rovers, who again was brilliant to me. I had seven or well, eleven years in total, uh, seven since I came back from Dundalk, and luckily played in a part of a great team with great great players, great staff, and uh, this is like the final chapter now, going back to where it all began. And before you were UCD, was it a case where you were at Cambridge United or was it a case after UCD you went to Cambridge United? No, I would have been at Cambridge before. I would have um at St. Kevin's Boys, that's my schoolboy club. We would have had a link with P uh, P3 United. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um so I would have initially, you know, everything was geared up to sign for P3, their academy split up, so everybody went from P3 and United's Academy mm -hmm. to Cambridge United's. So I just followed suit with that. So I would have um, signed for Cambridge uh, in my leaving cert year, but I would have uh, flown back and forth on a Friday after school, went over, played a match in England uh, Saturday morning, flying over Friday afternoon, stayed Friday night, played a match with Cambridge United Saturday morning and flew home Saturday evening Jeez. back to Dublin. So that was a way to keep me in school. You know, I didn't want, like, I was never allowed to leave school. I didn't want to leave school. I wanted to do me leaving, but I still wanted to, you know, go and play in, in the UK. Um, at that stage, Cambridge United's first team was struggling. Like, they were in the old Division 1. and No, they were in, yeah, Division 2. They were in Division 2, which is League 1. Mm. And they were getting... They were in the, the year I was doing me leave, they ended up getting relegated to League 2, which was Division 3. Um, and I just, you know, even myself, I was doing a lot of travelling. Um, 
and I just was I, I listen I don't know it's so long ago now um, mm. a lot of my like friends of mine or I played with school they were all going under 21s League of Ireland um, and I did enjoy playing in England for that period for the, the flying back and forth um, but it, something about me was drawing me to UCD there was like um, I knew this UCD scholarship that was starting to come around um, so I approached them um, I would have left came which I would have like it would have been a tough because they would have invested you know money and time into me get me over fly me over all year so I don't think they were too happy but um listen it was a great decision for me in the end because I came back I done my degree in UCD and then you kind of as you do your degree you learn your apprenticeship on the pitch mm-hmm. you do you know as much um academically as you do on the pitch it was a great environment it's a great platform for you to come into the league um you I was a young player, so I think it was 17 when I made my debut. So things like that mm. is, is great because it's so hard at, at different clubs. Even now, you see young players trying to get into first teams. Very difficult at mm-hmm. UCD. It's a different model. It's, you know, it's it's a young group, always has been. Uh, and it gives you a great platform to, as I said, learn your trade. But I, on the back of it, I got a degree and, and I just went from there. Yeah, unbelievable. Was football always the love that you had in school? Like, was that the thing that kept you, kept you in school, kept you in your friend groups? So? Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. it was definitely would have kept me um, out of trouble. You know, that was always the um, the excuse to you know when you were a kid, other friends would do other things, but they respected that you played football, so they kind of never asked you, you know, to go on the, like, go drink and things like that. Was, oh, and as a kid, as a 15-year-old, you know, you have to be disciplined. And I was one of them, you know, I wanted to play football. Um, I wanted to play football in England. Now, what, it, that didn't materialise in that sense. But I still, when I came, when I was with UCD, I, you know, I, I was a bit older at that stage. Yeah. Um, and I was in college, so you know, I would have been a bit wise at that. At least I knew if I did drink, I, I went out. Um you know, I did it, you know, at the right time. But, you know, as a kid, a 16, 15 year old, no, I didn't drink. You know, I had that discipline that uh, football was was important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting the, the way you've kind of talked about both the football and the academic side, particularly when you decided to go to UCD originally. What about your childhood kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of the best word, this like, where did that kind of come from? Was it something from maybe Just your parents? Family. Yeah, yeah was family, it all family driven? Yeah, uh, family would be would have done well, good jobs, would have um, been, been through college. Um, so no, it was structure, it was structure around me, I suppose. And everybody's different. Um, you can go to college if you maybe don't have that environment, but uh, I had that environment that was brought up in, uh, brothers, sisters. So um, they would have led me in it. They would have, um, when UCD came up, mm. you know, and I was flying back and forth to England with, you know, with, um, listen, you see the statistics of young boys going across the UK, very, mm. very difficult to crack it. Um, and this was just another option. And at the time, it maybe it was just, you know, a calculated mm. decision as a, even as a young kid, but it was something that I, I made with the best intentions um, mm. to get me, you know, for when you're nearly yeah, a life yeah. after football, you know, as a 17 year old, maybe that was part of it that you want to be armed with with education. So then you can at least, at least when I had my degree, I was able to then go full time football. And, you know, I went and I played for Fingon and played for Rovers, and you enjoy that. You train in the morning, we can just go back to bed in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. They're like the best years of your life because <laughs> you're getting paid, you're, you know, you've kind of finished college. You know, you're yeah. kind of just dossing about, you know, between the ages of 20, 21 and 24, 25, yeah, yeah. that. And then, then life starts changing and you start getting, you know, you, you, more pressure and more structure starts evolving. Yeah. And so that's how it went. And uh, yeah. again, this move's come about off the back of, you know, top process of life after football, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully finishing a couple of years with a master's and um, and then I'll be ready to finish football yeah. too. It's, it's so interesting because... You kind of talk about when the you obviously mentioned the statistic of when young players went to England and like you think and you have that offer at that age, every player, especially back like 10, 15 years ago, jumps at it. Whereas you see now, obviously with the Brexit rule, you're kind of getting that where players are have to stay here. So they're getting their appearances and they're nearly going either at a better time or like that when they're kind of 21, 22, where they've kind of had their apprenticeship years in football and they're kind of going over 
as more well-rounded players, probably more resilient people as well in mm. a way. Like if you go with 16, 17, it's very it young, must be so tough. Some, like. It is, and I've had this conversation with numerous people. It depends on the, the kid. Some kid would, will just have hate school and will be nearly getting in trouble and be nearly causing, um, say, just in, in community, getting in trouble. Mm. So the best thing for him is to be nearly in a professional environment, in a, you know, um, where he's... Um, listen, give him a chance, let him go and sign for a professional club in England because he's not going to go to school. He's not going to pass his leave and he's at home and he just wants to play football and he's getting in trouble. Where at least if you take that out and you put him into an environment of, of a, a club in England and they can you really keep an eye on him. Now, obviously, Brexit's changed that because mm. I would have been always an, the advocate of stay and do your education. Yeah. But some kids, it, they just don't like skill and mm. they're just not academic and that's fair enough um, and there's so many players that have left skill and not done the leave and, and actually went to England and had brilliant careers mm. and done it it's just mm. more difficult I feel as a 16 year old like you're dealing with just homesickness alone um, you're so young living in a you know a country um, don't get me wrong no language barrier but things like that but listen mm. you're out of your comfort zone of of the home comforts, you know, you're on your own, tough, tough long nights. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, I think every case is individual. I don't think there's a, a right case mm. and wrong case. I just think each case has to be taken um, individually. Do young players then in, in different environments you've been in who might, I suppose the Brexit will kind of change it, but before that come in who might have had offers, would they have ever actually came to you for advice? Kind of young lads maybe breaking into first teams or in, in clubs you've been involved in? Like I would have always, um, suggested the kids I felt go later because mm. I think when you go later and it's like if you play some games within the league automatically you're kind of going in more as a professional but like a lot of kids say I'm not sure I'm so I'm out of that loop now mm. in the sense that I would know that many kids um, you know going away at 15, 16 um, I would know them from Rovers but I wouldn't have got too involved or anything yeah, yeah. like that um, but if they if they're going um as a 16 year old a lot of them i'm not sure what way their contracts were when i was young it was like yts like youth scholarship mm -hmm. and then you might get a one-year pro or two-year pro but when you sign as an 18 year old a lot of the time you just going as a professional so yeah, you're going yeah. in more money you might have more appearances winning the league already you might have racked up you know 30 40 um senior appearances playing men's football which is always like I look at Enda Stevens, who's a friend of mine, and it, me and Enda played together at Rovers. Um, and he went late, you know, he went mm -hmm. late and went straight into Aston Villa on a good contract. But that's rare enough, you know, yeah, to go yeah. into a Premier mm -hmm. League club and like Seamus Coleman did it. There is cases, mm -hmm. but then there's cases for others that Kate players have went at 16 and had brilliant careers. And, mm -hmm. But it's obviously going at 16, the statistics would suggest. Yeah, it's the... You know, it's tough. tough. Yeah. It's tougher. So if you're going later, maybe you're just mentally mm -hmm. able to handle that bit more. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I think a lot of it's individual. Mm. No doubt. And I think one of the big advantages of the, the League of Ireland, especially when you're in like a top team, I know the Dundalk team and the Shamrock Rovers teams you were in were incredible. Um, there was three European games that I highlighted and Gary highlighted before the games, which was the Tottenham Hotspur fixture, um, playing AC Milan, then Maccabi Tel Aviv as well. I think you've over 62 uh, European appearances. Would those three games be considered the biggest games in the European fixtures? Or do you have any others that you think were special to you or that the fans don't know about? No, when I, actually, when I think of European football, <laughs> I would think of um, the biggest night was Belgrade. Mm -hmm. That was the one, really. That was the first club that, you know, qualified for, you know, group stage football. I think that was the game itself. Um, how it developed um, that would have been that would be the, the kind of the listen the, the European run with, with Dundalk was unbelievable as well the European run with Dundalk was um, was probably our, the, the most successful I've had mm -hmm. in terms of group stage football it's very difficult mm -hmm. um, but the European nights you know when you talk about individual games the Milan game would have been a brilliant game it was just during Covid yeah, oh, yeah. 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 and it was yeah. only a one-legger yeah one-legged affair where um, you would have been brilliant to play in the San Siro, yeah. you know, yeah. against, yeah. you know, and had, you know, thousands of yeah. Rovers fans, even Dublin fans, you know, Ireland fans, no just, coming over, yeah. just coming over, like random punters that just want to come to the San Siro and jump on mm. the bandwagon that was. Didn't happen, so that was that. Uh, the game in talent, 
the, the AC Milan game was just a bit of a shame because you would have had a sellout, you know, straight away, but it just wasn't the case. Um, Tel Aviv game was a brilliant game in a sense. It was the first club that actually had won a European group stage match. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, you're right, it was a brilliant occasion. Um, and the sports game was a great one. You know, sports really was good one. It was a big one. It was the biggest one in that that group stage football mm-hmm. when when we qualified for um for group stage football it was the bit was the one everybody wanted to play in it was boy heart lane family come over friends come yeah. over yeah and the match itself was a good game you know you know we were we were in it up until i think 63rd minute royce had scored and um no it was a good game but yeah but belgrade to be honest was was would be the pinnacle really just the night that was in it just how mm-hmm. the game developed the goals that were in it it was um and the night out after <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sorry to pause your podcast just a quick reminder from the introduction of the video make sure you reach out to the financial planning matters team on www.fpms.ie to secure your financial future today <laughs> I was watching uh, I was watching the the games again. So I watched the Spurs one, the main highlights on YouTube and the AC Milan one and I could I could feel the tension. Like I could I could feel it through the screen. Is it a case where you're looking at like world class players like Zlatan or I think Jermaine Defoe was in the in the Spurs teams when you're playing against them is the caliber gap extremely big or do you feel like on the day any player within like that Dundalk or Roberts team could really compete against those sorts of players? Yeah, Milan or Milan for the first twenty minutes was was awful. Like it was just it was just so good. That was a game that I have to say was really but then we settled into it a bit and we yeah. you know, um I don't know, maybe they'd scored and they just stepped off slightly, you mm-hmm. know, just ever so slightly. Uh, but they were fantastic. Sports is so long ago. Um, yeah, yeah, it was ages ago. Yeah. You know, it's hard to remember. The Milan game I remember they just gone for fifteen minutes, they just littered with like world class players like so um but then we kind of said we just grew into it a little bit then once you kind of get a few passes and the um would have helped if the fans were there you yeah know, no doubt it would have um yeah but yeah no think like when you're playing against that i've you know haven't played against loads i've played you know a lot of games in europe against the elite the top clubs i've played it against a handful and yeah you would notice the difference just between as the levels go up you notice the difference between the levels in round one round one early stage of european qualification to the last round you mm-hmm. know you, you, that's when you know you just see you know you get punished for mistakes it's it just gets harder and harder obviously as rounds go on the, the lesser teams get knocked out mm-hmm. more teams come into it and it should become stronger and stronger um and at that stage a lot is it down to luck getting a little bit of luck on the draw mm-hmm. um and like the the Belgrade wasn't really that was a you know a tough on paper that was a tough game um and we I don't know how we we got through but we got through um again with with Dundalk was Bate um and we were kind of evenly matched we'd played them the year before so we at least we knew a bit yeah. about them mm-hmm. um and with Rovers we played um a, a Scooby from I think it was Macedonia. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a good draw for us you know we fancied our chances and, and we done them and we were good at that stage mm-hmm. you know we had a strong squad um, and we pr- kind of had been building up to this stage uh, um, with Rover so it was a good draw for us but I've played in European football and I'm getting knocked out by teams from Bulgaria and um, teams from Czech Republic just fantastic teams like and you wouldn't have even heard of them mm-hmm. you know what I mean but just they can do it they just layered with quality players how, how is that going into play let's say you're going into one of these rounds and it's a team that you wouldn't have played in a previous kind of year so and you're going in basically just off some video analysis seeing what they're like how yeah, how difficult. hard is that prep because you, you although you can watch a team nah, as much you, you still can't feel what it yeah. actually is like to play against them what's that yeah. like as a player yeah and you can do you can watch a lot of video and you, you do re- as a player you, and as the, like Stephen Brady would be unbelievable and the fairness to to Stephen Kenny and Michael uh, the video is all you can do mm. you know what it is and you need lads to listen and buy into it because and you need to coach it's a, it's the league the games around Europe um, in fairness the Steve Bradley, we would have had um, over the years, we would have just had a training program that was just implemented us as players. We knew the training week, we knew it inside out. Um, when it comes around Europe, it's different because mm. you're, you're you're back and you're you're nearly starting again. In the sense that we knew, we know the opposition on a Friday night, 
whether it be playing against, you know, Pats. Because you're playing against, you've play got against that feeling like, yeah, you know what it's so, like. Um, but when you're playing European football, that, that's different. Mm. You're, you're nearly going back to the drawing board in a sense that you're, you're asking players to buy in to just, um, you, you're giving them um, whether information over the phone, like we get stuff sent to our WhatsApps. Mm. <clears throat> With Stephen, it would have been, you know, you were given um, like a dossier of players, just like a handout. Mm. Um, and then later years with, with Rovers there was more it was just online it was stuff mm. all that was given to us online and then you're just trusting players as well because there's always there's also just time constraints because you, you you have a match on a Friday in the league mm. you know you might come in for do recovery on a Saturday then the game could be Tuesday or Wednesday so you're trying to get a lot of information into players and the manager last year Stephen um, wouldn't have never given us information before, um, like you wouldn't have, if we were playing Pats on a Friday, we would never have looked on it. The European it, game before that, yeah. Never, you know, yeah. it just wouldn't, yeah. it would never happen. Yeah. So then um, you're kind of, you're always, you never have that much time to prepare, but that's, mm. yeah, it's across European football. That's just, you no, know, mm. we're just another club. I'm sure everybody's yeah. the same, but you're asking players to just buy into it a little bit. And uh, if you're given information, because it's, you know, you're on the pitch then, whether it be come Tuesday night, Wednesday night, um, and you need to know as much as you can because, as I said, you, you're not you're not seeing mm. these players on a regular basis. Just uh, one more question on the European stuff. Um, we we always talk about, to be honest, on the <clears throat> on the podcast where, for example, the Irish national team mightn't do so well, and I think it's, sometimes for us we think it's a kind of fan ignorance where you you don't watch other countries enough. Have you ever had a game where you went to play a team and you? Maybe or you or you felt the team environment kind of thought, ah, we'll, we'll, we'll beat these. And then they ended up like that some random club no one's ever heard of. And they've actually been a lot better than maybe was perceived going into the game. Yeah, as that ever happened. I played a club in um, Boleslav, Mole Boleslav. From, and I have never don't think I've ever got a chase like it. Really? They were just brilliant. Just <laughs> yeah. so technical. So uh, we played them in Dublin and it was 3-2, Graham Borg scored uh, one unbelievable goal. And we yeah. scored one late on kept us in it and then we played them away and they were just brilliant um just the weather didn't help it was very mm. warm but that was a hiding uh they were, I, it was a close enough game over there it could have been 2-1 or something mm. like that like but we were never in it you know they were just miles better so that's kind of you're talking about not massive clubs but mm. like just technical players um like played mold the last year the year before and in European football away and it was just just a hiding yeah. you know they're a good club though you know they're a big, <laughs> big, big club um, Florida Italian a couple of years ago again when we played mm. my Rovers a lot of people might have thought that we'd go and do them they were good mm. I played them against them 11 years ago with Rovers and we did beat them we beat them over two legs one nil and then we played them uh, a couple of years ago um, and they were good they, they were better than what we thought mm. um, and and they, they knocked us out um, and then Estonian team we played last year again good side like you know these like you, you play in Europe and you know there's there's no bad bad teams yeah, you yeah. know you might get lucky on a draw like you, you might get a smaller team from a smaller nation that you should really come out there. a lot of games are even mm. you know and there's never a lot in it um, and then you just you know that's you know you're prepare yourself as best you can if it's a 50-50 game you just you're hoping mm. you come out on top yeah mm -hmm. and like Irish football as well like I know there's obviously a lot of talk about facilities and whatnot nowadays but you could argue that Irish football was kind of going through a stagnant phase and you forget all these other countries are evolving or investing or they're evolving well, like Scandinavian that. football mm. but now like you know they, their model would be it's changed in the last 15 years I think they really stopped and rebuilt and mm. um, they're, they're reaping the benefits of it now yeah exactly yeah so off the back of um, of four in the row titles with Shamrock Rovers if you could summarise as the captain what would be the main aspects that you've seen that allowed you to get to four titles in a row in terms of was it consistency was there a special ingredient that fans and coaches and players don't see what's your opinion or take on getting four titles in a row i think uh it's it's hunger within the dressing room i think that's it honestly i think mm. coaches and uh the staff were brilliant but i think it just comes from within that group as well like that um you know in the dressing room like have you got the stomach to go again because like 
it, the fans, they, like everybody wants it, but it's having that, you know. And we went to the wire like each year, like mm -hmm. you know, I think the first year we did it, we ran like it was a year COVID, but mm -hmm. we we won that one, you know, well. Like, but you know, I think if the year had it went on, yeah, it would have been the, a massive distance. I think we still won it. I can't remember how many points, fourteen mm -hmm. points or something. Mm -hmm. Um. But I think, yeah, like it, the staff, in fairness, at, at Rovers drove it and then the players just just bought into it, just accepted it. And, and you know, you have to want, you have to want that pain to go again because um, playing, like a, a, you, when you play at Rovers, in fairness, everybody wants to beat you and that's just natural. And then mm -hmm. when you play at Rovers and you're three in a row, going for four in a row, just everybody wants to stop you. Mm. So that was it. And it just, it's had been able to overcome that. So that was the one. Hunger went in the dressing room. It was a great dressing room. A lot of men, you know what I mean? It's a lot of, and I would have alluded to it um, last year, like teams would have, or, you know, uh, critics would have, would have said, you know, they're getting older. And we were getting older, but we still were full of experience. Mm -hmm. And we still always had enough to get over the line. Never, um, Squad helped. Um, manager was able to build a you know talented squad. It's his own team. It, like the manager's been there so long. Every player that was in that dressing room was his player. Mm -hmm. Things like that help because you're signing players that they're yours. So it was, but that was it. It was it was driven from within the dressing room with the help of you know the staff above us um, and just having that hunger. Just because mm -hmm. now you're never getting any, anything easy. You know, there's always, as I said, teams want to beat you and want to stop you being champions. And yeah, so that that was it. Like I mean, it, the the experience helps, but it was just that hunger. You know. Going mm -hmm. back to the well again, and then then just and no, and that, no one that was four in a row on the line, and I'm sure for the lads this year, no one that's five in uh, in a row potentially on the line. That you know that drives mm -hmm. you, big time. You know, having that, having that carrot, having that something in front of you to 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 aim for, just helps. So if, if let's say hunger in the dressing room, driven by management, bought in by the players, that's like the catalyst of the energy side. How do you deal with the player that you see consistently? doesn't have the hunger or just doesn't buy into that energy. Just gets left behind. Yeah, simple as, just the group. Simple yeah. as, just the group was so strong last year that it would have been just led by the the, the, the new, a lot of nucleus was still there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the lads have one fun row. I think there's 12 of us. Okay, yeah. So there's yeah. already like, so so then if like lads who, were, who had the club had inherited and who had signed, um, they just had to buy in or otherwise the group would, would just, and the manager would be brilliant like that. He would just, the show goes on, mm -hmm. you know, you either buy in, or you just kind of let me And we would have done, you know, um, psychological work with it last year and things like that. Um, where, cause you always need that edge. So the manager last year would have been looking at, you know, like how you have to keep evolving, whether it's keep signing players, better players, um, just getting the edge, whether it's getting them, um, psychologist in just to help us or mm. things like that and he was great like that just giving you maybe just extra percent extra couple of percent but that was that was the mentality that you know if you had someone that was pulling against it it didn't really matter because the group the core group was still strong enough that would just it would keep going and the manager would be kind of cutthroat like that as well that he would kind of cast people aside if he had to yeah but in fairness there was no one really like that it was yeah a good group yeah especially to get four titles in a row man. yeah um on a personal note, just so, I think if you were to talk about League of Ireland players, let's say in terms of the most decorated, who's been around the longest as most consistent, your name would absolutely be in the hat. But when it comes to everything outside of football, like you're obviously a husband, you're a dad to two daughters, and you're also working as well. Mm. Has it been a case where, let's say, over your football career that... Even with Shamrock Rovers and playing in Europe and Dundalk, have you had to balance football and work? Or how have you managed that over the last six to eight years? Has it just been football? Or have you also been in uh, work as well? No, yeah. When I came back from Dundalk, I went straight into work, straight into employment. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a balance. And obviously um, now it's just become a little bit more difficult with kids and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, fairness you know my wife would be very good like she would understand like we've been together a long time so she would yeah. al also understand the pressures of football um i suppose what it what it takes you know she would have you know been with me when i've um 
earlier on in my career so she would have kind of understood that i played football and that i like mm. you know thursdays you take it easy friday you know you have a lie on so she would leave me you know and she would you know even now even with the kids now she'd be very good like that that um you need that bit of space you need that um little bit of time just to prepare for your game and that will never change even though now um you know, there's more pressure at home, you know, kids, she will still be very um, accommodating in that sense. Mm -hmm. And then the, the employment thing was just about um, getting set up really for life after football. When I came back from the dock, it was, you know, I wanted to come back, buy a house. Um, I wanted to just not be retiring at 35, 36. Now it's probably going to be more 37, 38. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then having to get start, you know, I wanted to have. So hopefully now when I retire, at, you know, if it's 37, 38, whatever it may be, I'll have 12 years working experience. I'll have my previous degree and hopefully have my master's. So that, will listen, won't be easy for the next couple of years. No. She's going to have to be um, <laughs> vigilant with me. Um, but I would, you know, you, you make time, you know, you have to, you know, social life, things like that will have to be sacrificed. Um, yeah. But who I my employers are very good you mm -hmm. know I work uh, the people uh, Jonathan Roach who I work for uh, in Hyundai Drive View brilliant you know I work with him in Go Car mm -hmm. so again same uh, same same boss took me he left I went with him yeah um, so he knows you know what I mean so um he appreciates and he also he doesn't let me uh, take the piss either you know yeah, with no work, doubt, I yeah. have to do my work I have to come in make sure business is coming in the door. And once he's happy, you know, yeah. he lets me, you know, football, he understands that football is a massive part of my life. Um, so now it's a balancing act. Um, and you, you can do, you know, you, the, the, the job I do, you can do a lot of it on the phone, you're on the road, so it's not like you're stuck in an office, mm -hmm. you know, all day, every day. You can do a lot of it on the road, things like that, which helps. Mm -hmm. And then it's all to be armed for, you know, life after football. You know, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I've, I've always kind of, throughout my whole career that's always been um, you know just behind the scene you know what you do where you end up you know and that's driven me because I want to keep playing because I love it mm. but you know never get away from the fact that the day will come where you just can't play and yeah. you have to stop I just then, think that's so important man like even we've been talking for I don't know how long maybe 40 minutes 50 minutes at this stage and from the moment you were 15, 16 making decisions to go to Cambridge to let's say have a good crack of football, but also kept motivation for school, making mm. a good decision to go to UCD. It always constantly sounds like that discipline side has just allowed for consistent planning. And although you're trying to live and play in the present, that there is like a future or even for your daughters, let's say with school and college. And it's always just like a step ahead, planning yeah. for a house, well, planning it's for fear, a house. You know, the fear mm. that you live yeah, yeah. You know, I play like that in football. You always you play better, I feel, when you're playing the edge, you know, that... I think once you're too relaxed and too um, content in the moment, you kind of let your guard down. Mm -hmm. Where um, I'm not always chasing something else, um, but it'd be fair to say my eye would always be, you know, what's next? You know, you, it, this is in the present, but like, you know, it's like when you're coming to the end of your one year contract and you're, if you're scrambling around looking for a club, like that would be something that would always be in a big fear of mine. And yeah. luckily I never, I was always managed to evade it. Um, but that would be, and some players like, that's not saying, that, that was just my take on it. You know, everybody's different. Um, and again, maybe that was down to structure, family, things like that, which helped yeah. um, what we talked about. But <clears throat> no, it is, it's something that, um, just naturally led me back to UCD and somewhere again, as I said, the environment there and the football there, the facilities mm. there, the people there. Mm -hmm. Something that now I feel like is, um, you know, when I was at Rovers for the last seven years, um, and not saying in, uh, it doesn't, like the hunger was still there within me, but it was just time for me to move. Mm -hmm. um, and now this has given me a new kind of lease in a sense of football. You know, now I'm really looking forward to going out training now. There's a bit of a buzz back in me mm -hmm. where, you know, when you're at the same club for so long and you're so successful. And I was never like, I'm nearly talking like I'm, the hunger was gone for me. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. But this is just a personal change. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that, and I spoke to Stephen Bradley on it, that Rovers couldn't offer this. You know, Rovers couldn't offer the, the Masters and things like that. You know, it's a different angle. You know, at my stage in my career, uh, 
the goalpost just needed to change for me personally, and mm-hmm. this is the perfect environment. And mm-hmm. um, but at least I know what the environment I'm going into is you know good people, great facilities. Um, you know it's a Dublin club, and they want to come back up. You know, and mm-hmm. that's it. I'm playing first division football with the ambition to win. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I find it so interesting because uh, in in both the last two off seasons, so the League of Ireland one and the the summer one for kind of the UK lads, we obviously would have worked with a lot of players individually and. I can't get over the amount of players who, when you ask, what's your plan for next year? And they're like, I don't really know. Yeah. I just find that, like, that would freak me yeah, out. And obviously, yeah, me you, are, you obviously were saying that I just find that, like Gary mentioned, that foresight you've always seemed to have to always be one step ahead is is quite quite important, I think, for people to hear, um, whether they're in football or not, to be honest. Um, and how hard is that to balance? And Gary said, we're, we're trying to be in the moment and enjoying the European games or the, the league win. Like, is it is it kind of hard to balance that? Or... Are you able to go, right, we've won a league, I can enjoy this couple of weeks, but then, right, what's next? Is yeah, that, that's kind of mindset. Like that, and I think a lot of footballers are like that. The lows always out of a way to highs because mm. if I have a loss or if I played poorly or, you know, you lost a cup final. Like, I've got relegated, mm. I've lost two cup finals, I've had serious lows. Like, mm. And a lot of them, you know, they would linger longer. You know, where, you know, you win a cup or you win a league, um, that initial euphoria, it can move on quite fast. Um, and I suppose that's just the nature of the sport. Um, I think a lot of maybe sports people are like that because mm. uh, then they chase the next one. And I'm not like one of these people that just, you get my medal and I disregard it. I mm. don't, I, I, you know, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the work that the team has done, that the mm-hmm. group has done mm. to be successful. And you kind of, it's great great to celebrate um, together and with family mm. you know everybody there things like that are so important and I've learned as I've got older to appreciate that more because your career is running out you're, you know when you're maybe mm. early 20s um, you're not saying but you would be like you know not appreciative you know because mm. now I'm kind of going right how many years I left God if I got another yeah. medal you know it's like so that's what it was the last few years you know you were you were cherishing them that bit more Um. But yeah, no, it, it is. It has always been foresight, just um, fear, as I said, it is. It's something that I would push down to young kids, like mm. in the sense that um, without being, because you have to be careful how you approach it, mm. because I would never suggest, you know, you know, well, what if this doesn't work out? What are you doing? Mm. And they'd be saying, well, why are you saying that to me? Like, what if yeah, it does work yeah. out? You'd have to be careful. Like, you'd be just kind of going, like, with just keep an eye on this, you know, if there was something like an opportunity, like if a, young players are playing in England now and if they were up for it and they would you know I would be saying like do something at night just do a course mm. at night you know I mean what are you doing you're sitting in the apartment you know if there's an opportunity to just go and do something just just do it it'll help mm. you because mm. I think you know employers when the time comes like, oh you play football but you did this as well you know you're a, a type of character that you know, was willing to take on more than one task at one time. Um, mm. So things like that, but, like, it's hard with kids, you know, sometimes, like, you know, you, you can't say too much, like, yeah. it's their life as well, but you you would steer them, you know, you would suggest things to them, and, and for young boys now, I would always have suggested, even while playing with Rovers, um, you know, UCD, the model was is always, I think, it's just hard to compete with, especially if you're academic, if you're a good young footballer in Ireland and you liked school or you didn't mind school and, you know, you a, you know, education was something that, you know, you were happy to know. I would have always, um, if they'd ever asked me, like, I listen, I'd play for Rovers, I would never drive anyone away from it, but um, UCD model was always something that, I came through, a lot of pl- good players I played with came through, Kieran Kandolf, people like that, as went on, had a great career, but he started at UCD, you know, he started mm. Rovers as a kid, then he went to UCD, and it gives you a great platform. So I think as as young players go, you you know, what they offer is rare, in the sense that you just can't get it anywhere else. Mm. Mm-hmm. Just before we conclude, Ron, I know, like uh, like any of your mutual friends and yourself, you're a very busy man, mm-hmm. and uh, there's definitely a lot to go on. Just finally, um, as we as we extend out the conversation, what do you see in the next five or six years that's going to help National League football and international football in Ireland? Yeah, I think it's the crowds are just really changing the goalpost in a positive way. Something that uh, like when I was. 
first entered the league. It was a long time ago now, I won't say many years, but um yeah, it was like it was always Rovers were always big club. There was always like, you know, Rovers were the big club. Um but now in fairness to other clubs, they've kind of the fans at Rovers have continued to grow. Pats now have got bigger, Daily Mount's got like, you know, the, the fans, you know, you go to Daily Mount, it's a sellout. Um, Pat said, "What would be brilliant would be if, if like again, I'm coming back to facilities. You see, you know, Tallis Stadium, the infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, uh, if you are just a family coming over from the UK or whatever, you're going to watch a match, which is just nice. Yeah, you yeah. know, some facilities because I think the, the numbers are growing, and I think if it's in Chicago had more seats, I think in the big Dublin games." They'd sell, they'd sell more, like they'd sell an extra 2,000 seats. Mm -hmm. It's just that um, there's 3,000, maybe 3,500 daily mount or 3,500 in, in, in Inch Corp, but um, they're, they're only ever going to sell. Yeah. That's the max they can ever get for revenue for the club. You know, the, the, there's a ceiling on that. Mm -hmm. Where in fairness, the Rovers now, um, I think the... the, the the capacity will go up to 10,000 mm -hmm. on big European nights. I think they'll get 10,000. Yeah. So it's the infrastructure I have. And I think they need help from, you know, whether it be, whether it be the government, whether it be FAI, um, whether you team up with county councils, things like that, just to make it more appealing for St. Pat's to work with DCC, mm -hmm. you know, and go, right, we're going to build a community club here. Mm -hmm. We're going to, um, things like that, which will help because, I think that's where we are at the minute. Um, it's hard for... And I know there's a lot of private investors coming into the league, mm -hmm. which is great within, I think, it, which is brilliant, but I think you can't take the soul out of a club. And I think the soul of a club is the communities that the, 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 like the likes of Drogheda that have now... Um, um, and I think they have 100% ownership has gone to a Canadian crowd, is it? Is it Canadian-American? Mm, yeah, I think so, yeah. So I would love, that's brilliant because they'll invest money and they'll bring um, money into the club. But I think there has to be somebody within the club um, that have uh, draw his best interests at heart that you see kind of what happened with Dundalk and the American crowd come in and kind of just, I think it may, a, lot, a few people from Dundalk from the um, behind the scenes may have stepped away, but they were the people that ran the club mm. from when I was there and many years before. And then if the American crowd, if things aren't working out, and they go, okay, well, we're done, we'll move on. And then, you know, the community is left to pick up the pieces. Mm. So, um, <laughs> like, I think there's a lot more that still can be done. I think the, the, the league is making strides. Obviously, facilities, you know, is a massive one. Um, and it is great that these, there's more, you know, investors coming in. It's just, you just don't want them coming in and just taking the, the soul out of a club, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. No it's doubt. hard to expect the investors to come in then and go, just build a new stadium. Like, there's obviously a lot of money involved in that, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, the appetite is definitely there, isn't it, for the, for no, the league see, in a sense with, with, with crowds. With, with our league, with four teams qualifying for Europe, mm. you know, um, which is rare, but I think it's a 10-team league, and I mm. think potentially four clubs in Europe, which is, you know which is in common amongst, you know, you, you look at European football. So that's maybe, and there's also, listen, there's the, the league is full of, you know, talented players. Um, so there is, you know, if you can do it, it's hard to make money in League of Ireland, but they're obviously looking at it going, okay, there's a potential here. Mm. Um, so no, and it is, it's as long as the, you know, you know, inf like the, the media outlets, I think everybody really, over the last couple of years, it's helps with, um, just the likes of YouTube, everything like it's just grown. It's mm. it's it's more out there. Everybody can just see goals instantly. You know, mm. you're not waiting for you know Monday night football. Everything is instant. You know, the clubs the are now on Republic. it. Do you remember that? Yeah, so the, clubs, that the clubs are now on it with their, so, their yeah. own social media and they're getting stuff out to fans. You know, they're, mm. they're interacting, which is all which all helps. You've got mm. viral things go because I was only thinking about that there at the Soccer Republic <laughs> show. I remember I seen Patrick McElhenney score a goal against Drogheda. He gets on like the left side, goes through a couple of people, like dinks it. Oh, like, yeah. that, that would have went viral. No, I like know. if it was a couple now. of years later. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so you kind of forget how important that is. Mm. I think also a big, a big factor that I've seen definitely, especially just for young players, is 
introduced in the underage League of Ireland sides because mm. now kids are getting attached to clubs mm. at, let's say, 12 years of age. But regardless even, like, they're just playing, like, for example, when you were at St. Kevin's, you'll always remember the first club that you played with, like, let's say, at 12s or 13s at, like, your highest level. And I think that draws a natural attraction, makes it more... It, decreases the barrier to entry to actually go to games you know players names you come yeah. way more familiar and then hopefully as those players progress through it's just going to be a conveyor belt all the yeah, time I know there's a new affili- players all the time there 100 i see it with rovers you know i see the young boys and we all know them you yeah. know what i mean which is brilliant mm-hmm. like for our, you know they would be in training in roadstone when we'd have been there when i'd have been there but you kind of get to know the kids mm-hmm. and you know and they you know just give them high fives things like that so you're right there's that element that um, within you know whether it be other league of Ireland clubs having that you know underage system coming through and then that just is a breeding ground for players because you want to produce your own players you want to yeah. players coming through your academy mm-hmm. and I think they have like I'm, I'm again it's coaching it's not something that um, you know I'm fully aware of you know in a sense of what the standards are like through other clubs Um. And it's not something that I will particularly go into after football, mm-hmm. but I just know from Shamrock Rovers that um, there was the, the first team players, we knew all the kids, and that was great. And the kids, you know, we'd have been able to, you know, have a little chat with them, whether it be Saturday morning when we were finished training and yeah. they were going out to the matches, things like that. Yeah. So that was nice, you know, and that then all of a sudden they're growing up or they're maybe coming to our matches on Friday night and they have that affiliation, then mm-hmm. oh, I want to emulate, you know, I want to you know, keep going, keep going, mm-hmm. maybe play for Sam McGrover's first team, things like that. Yeah. So no, 100%. No, no doubt. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming on, Ron, and best of luck for this season. And I know that's not going to be the last one going yeah. by the way that you're conversing there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. appreciate your time, man. No, thanks, lads. No, it's been good. Very good. Cheers. Thank, thank you very thank much. You.